Sometimes you'll need some custom code, and if you need to write that, you can do that right over here. And we've split the custom code into three different parts. Functions, widgets, and actions. Okay, well, what are these? Well, functions are used with data binding. So if you come over here, and let's go to our page title right here, and in the text here, when you do this set from variable pop-out, you can see that down here are our custom functions. So let's say you had a custom function that uppercased some word. Well, you would just bind that function right here, and then whatever you pass in would go through that transformation. So wherever you see this set from variable icon, you can attach a custom function. Okay, cool. What about custom widgets? Well, widgets are visual things, just like all the widgets you use to build your app. These are widgets, and you can make custom widgets if we don't have one that you need. And you can find these under this tab right here. And finally, we've got custom actions. And you use custom actions in the action flow editor. So let's say we've got a button here and we want to run some logic when the user clicks this button. Well, then you come over to these actions and let's add an action. Let's open it up in our action flow editor. And you can see down here, custom actions. That's where you would find them. And these are nestable. So maybe I have a custom action that receives a string, but before it goes in there, I want to run a custom function over that. That's fine. You can do that. Okay. Well, that sounds good, but maybe you're thinking, I don't know how to code. So what am I supposed to do? Well, for that, I have two recommendations. First, we've got a built-in code copilot right here. So you just enter in what you want your function to do, run it, and it will write the code for you. Now, make sure you define your arguments and your return value and the name of your function first, and it'll produce amazing code for you. And the second recommendation is to learn to code. Okay, I know what you're thinking. That kind of takes a really long time and it's complicated. Well, actually with just a few hours, you can become kind of dangerous. And there are tons of great, free resources. Let me highlight two for you. So this language is Dart. And if you go on the Dart website, dart.dev, and you go into the overview section, you can read about the language. And then at the bottom here, you have a bunch of learning resources. And second, there's some awesome free YouTube courses on Dart. That is one from Flutterly, Rivan Ranawat, and Codemy. These are incredible courses that if you just spend a little bit of time every day, you can write some really good code in just a few weeks. Okay, so in the next three videos, we're going to have one lesson on each of the functions, widgets, and actions. But in the remainder of this lesson, I want to give you 10 tips to help you work efficiently in Flutterflow's custom code editor. First, auto-completion. Now, there are two types of auto-completion in the editor, semantic and IntelliSense. Now, the IntelliSense is going to look at all of these imports. These are other files and packages of code that are being imported into this project, so you have access to them. So, IntelliSense will look at that and give you auto-completion. So, over here, I've got this math library, and so I have access to that. So, when I do math dot, I get this menu, and I can see what methods I have available to me. But sometimes you won't get that. And that's because IntelliSense, or what we call the code analyzer, is not up and running. And this can happen for many reasons. For instance, maybe your internet goes in and out. And if that happens, you'll only have access to the semantic autocompletion. So I'm going to turn off my internet and show you what that's like. Okay, so now my internet's off. And if I do the same thing, math, I don't get that autocompletion. I only get this ABC math. It's just saying, do you want to write a string called math? But I do get some autocompletion. So let's say I've got a variable about an animal and I want to reference it later. I type a n and then I can see that I get some auto completion because this semantic auto completion just looks at what you've written already and gives you access to that. Tip number two, if your code analyzer is off, but you do have internet access, you can trigger it to retry to connect by just closing and opening this. And there we go. It's up and running again. Third tip, you don't need to compile every time you make a change. Okay, so what's compiling? Well, let's just return a string here because that's what we need. So return and let's save this function. And you can see over here, it says check your custom function for errors. Now, technically, this is not compilation, but we're just going to call it compilation because in custom actions and widgets, you do have to compile. 
Now, the first time you write a function, widget, or action, you will have to compile because you're going to be getting this error. But if you're in a test mode and you make changes, all you have to do is save. You don't have to compile again. So let me show you what I mean. I'm just going to check this for errors. Great. So let's go bind this in our editor. So we're going to come over here to our button and just going to bind this to our custom function. Great. Now let's test it. Okay, there it is. Now let's make a change. So let's come over here and just return cap. So let's save it. And I am getting an error, but because I have a test mode going, it doesn't matter. And if we just reload, beautiful. So you only need to compile the first time you write it or when you need to check for errors. Tip number four, if you are compiling, you don't need the compilation to finish before you save. Flutterflow will just save whatever's in here. The fifth tip has to do with code copilot. Now, I briefly mentioned this before, but when you're using Code Copilot, the AI is not just looking at whatever description you have in here. It's also looking at the function name, the argument name and type, and the return type. So you want to make sure those are all semantic. That is, they describe precisely what they are. So if I have a function that combines words, I would call it combine words. And the arguments would be called word one and word two. Sixth, you have access to all the imports. So like we said before, you have access to all of the math library and the time ago library. Now, you may be wondering, well, how do I know what's in there? Well, if it has package in front of it, you can just Google it and you can read the documentation. Same thing with these Dart core libraries. There's great documentation available. If they are Flutterflow libraries, you can just download the code and take a look. And if you don't know what it does, you can just copy and paste it into ChatGPT or Bard and ask what it does and how to use it. And it works great. So let me show you that. Let's just delete this for now and save it and come up here and download the code. And let's check out this place file. All right, so here's the file and it's kind of short and maybe I don't know how to code, so I don't know what any of this means. So I'm just going to copy this and jump over into ChatGPT. So I'm going to say, what is this code and how do I use it and paste it in. And it says this code defines a dark class called FF place and it's representing a geographical location. And then it says we can use it like this. Oh, I see now I can create an instance of this place object. So it has latitude and longitude, name, etc. Okay, cool. Notice also that you have access to custom functions. So any other functions you write here, you can reference them simply by their name. Seventh, handle null explicitly. Okay, so first off, what's null? Well, null is just a kind of value, just like a string or an integer or Boolean, and it just represents nothing. And the problem is, is that sometimes null can cause problems because if a variable or a function or a widget gets the value null and it can't handle it, it doesn't know what to do, your app can crash. And the fix to that is to handle null explicitly. Okay, what does that mean? That just means you need to know exactly what will happen if you get a null value and then handle it. And as a general principle, your parameters should be nullable but your returns not. Now, this is not absolutely true, but it'll probably cover you in 95% of the cases. So let me show you this. So I've got two arguments here and they're both set to nullable. And that means the value of this variable word one can either be a string or null. And this can be kind of confusing because you say, oh, I set the type to string. Well, yes, but a nullable string. So it actually can be two values. And like I said, let's make the return value not nullable. So it can only be a string. Okay, so let's handle null explicitly. I've said these can be null, so we need to do a null check. So we'll do word one, set it equal to word one, and I'll explain this in a second, or empty string. And then we'll just duplicate this and change it to word two and same here. So what this is doing is when this function is run, if a string comes in for word one and word two, like hello world, then we're going to assign that value to the variable. But if it comes in as null, and that's what this does, then we're going to set it to an empty string. So either way, it'll be a string. 
Now, why would we do this? Well, this makes your function a little more resilient. So in case something goes wrong and you get a null passed in, nothing's going to crash. Also keep in mind that even if a variable can accept the value of null, what that variable is bound to might not. So if I have a return value here of nullable, that means I could return either a string like cat or null. And so this is fine. The function would work. It would be no problem. But often you're binding the result, so whatever comes out of here, to some sort of text. And text widgets can't have null as a value. So just keep that in mind. Tip number eight, there's a debugger. And let me show you that. So let's add an action here. And let's just return a string and grab that boilerplate, copy it into the editor, and let's just return something that's an error, an integer. So we're gonna save our action, and over here you can access our debugger. And this tells us what the error is and where it is. Awesome. Tip number nine, use print. So let's go back into our custom function over here, and let's add in a print hello world. We don't need any arguments, so we can just remove those. Let's save it, check it for errors, and test. Okay, great, there's our app, but if we open up the console, so Command or Control Shift I, we get a hello world. And that's because print functions like console.log, and actually it is console.log. Print gets compiled into console.log. The tenth and final tip, shortcuts. If you right click and go into this command palette, or F1, you can see all the commands and the shortcuts that are available to you. And in these last 60 seconds, I'm going to give you the 15 most helpful ones. So here we go. One, multiple cursors. If you click and option click, you can add multiple cursors. And this is helpful if you want to rename variables or other tasks. Two, option up and down arrow. This will move the line of code. Maybe I want to move this line outside of the if block. I press option up and it moves it up or down end. Three, quick fix, command period. Let's create an error here. Let's take off M on trim. And when you hover over, you've got this quick fix. And if you want to accept it, you can just do command period and select it. Hover. When you hover over a method or a property that's coming from somewhere else, you can see the documentation. Format document, shift option F. So maybe I've got some stuff that's whack out here like this. And if I do shift option F, it formats it. That's the same as clicking this. Command F is search and shift command F will give you the find and replace. Another way to get cursors is shift option drag. So I press shift option and click and drag. And now I've got multiple cursors over here. Nine select line is command L. F1 is the command palette. Command F2 is change all occurrences. So now I can change all of the website URLs here. 12, refactor, shift control R, and you can surround with all of these options. 13, code folding, option command left bracket, or you can just go to the left here and open and close it. 14, you have your command Z and shift command Z to undo and redo. And finally, 15, shift option up or down will duplicate the line above or below. Memorize those and you will be a fast coder. And that's custom code in Flutterflow.